Hello. This is the third of the lectures having to do with the metaphor of the healing of the nations. Uh, we've talked about the metaphors of the purification of the bodily temple. We've talked about health and healing as observing the laws of nature. And now we've been talking for a while about the metaphor of healing as a part <clears throat> of the great um, healing of the cosmos. Today I wanted to carry on um, the story of the healing of the nations um, that focuses on the period of uh, the years of consolidation as we've talked about it. And uh, this is basically the years in the first half of the 20th century. Um, it's from basically the time of the death of Ellen White until uh, after the Second World War. But then we go on in following this metaphor into the years of exploration, which go from the 1960s generally to the present time. And, um, of course, I have to say again that each of these metaphors are to be found in all of the periods, although some of these metaphors tend to be particularly important in certain periods, but they continue throughout the entire existence of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And um, certainly that's true of this metaphor, uh, which is based on the apocalyptic understanding of the great controversy between good and evil. You recall that um, we talked about John Harvey Kellogg having built up all these different institutions in Chicago and his bringing the students from Battle Creek at the American Medical Missionary College into Chicago. And he um, he also had Anna Knight, as you recall, that came from the South and she went back to Mississippi and then she went to India. Another couple, and the first group of persons that we're going to talk about, are Harry and Maud Miller. Uh, they were from the Midwest and they got married. They were both students at the American Medical Missionary College. They were both studying medicine. And um, they were taken into Chicago along with all the other students, but they were very good students. They spent a couple of years uh, in their last uh, period of their medical school at the Rush uh, Medical School in Chicago. This was uh, a couple that John Harvey Kellogg saw had great potential, and he had great plans for them. And they passed the state board examinations. Uh, in fact, Maud did better than Harry Miller did. But they were offered positions as professors of, uh, and teachers of medicine in uh, the Rush Medical Center. They turned it down. This was so appalling to John Harvey Kellogg that he drove over uh, to uh, Chicago and met with them. And he said, you are the people that are the ones that can take the Adventist uh, community into uh, the best schools of medicine in the United States. But they had a vision. And it was very much John Harvey Kellogg's mission, but they were excited, as were a lot of Americans at that time, a lot of Christian Americans, to go overseas. And their great vision was to go to China. That particular country was also popular among other uh, religious communities and young people who wanted to go to China. As a matter of fact, the uh, people who went to China and became missionaries, their children often became scholars uh, in um, universities in the United States many years later. Some of them became diplomats. So that th this period, the early part of the 20th century, was a period where Adventists, along with others, were excited about going to China. <clears throat> this, by the way, was, I think, part of the background to the clash between John Harvey Kellogg and Ellen White and 
the people who were running the Adventist church. Why? John Harvey Kellogg was a health reformer as well as a person who knew how to conduct regular medicine, but he knew what could be done in reforming America. He didn't think that you could do that and at the same time expend your resources to go overseas. Ellen White had traveled to Europe. Ellen White had gone to Australia. J.N. Andrews, a young protege of hers, had gone to Europe. The Adventists uh, wanted, as John Harvey Kellogg did not, to expand Adventism worldwide. And that's part, I think, of the split, the debate over allocation of resources uh, of the Adventist church. What's interesting, of course, is, as we'll see, when these folks like Miller, uh, Harry, and Maud go overseas, when others go uh, to uh, Germany, or as we'll see with the Millers, as they go to China, they take John Harvey Kellogg's approach to health with them. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's to have institutions in the suburbs, Battle Creek wasn't a suburb, but it was a semi-rural, um, small city. And he also wanted to take them into big cities, right? And to help the poor. That idea of helping people in the suburbs or in the nice sections of town and also in the poor sections of town is replicated in Adventist health in many parts of the world. The whole emphasis on prevention, that you'll see also, is taken particularly by the Millers into China. And so John Harvey Kellogg's vision, which was after all based on health reform, uh, not just the Adventists, but other people, uh, was exported everywhere. But uh, he didn't go along with the idea of moving as rapidly as others did into the world. <clears throat> Maud and Harry uh, were truly Adventists, and this goes not only to John Harvey Kellogg, but to Whites, because they bought a printing press, and they took it with them as they got on a ship and went to China via Japan. They picked up some uh, blocks of uh, Chinese characters with them in Japan. And so they landed in China, and then they went from the ports of China into the interior of China. And there they set up their printing press. They diluted uh, the ink with castor oil, but they were physicians after all, so they set up a clinic. They set up the printing press. They started classes. Does that sound familiar with John Harvey Kellogg uh, in Battle Creek? And this wasn't a part of the Adventist uh, approach so much, but they dressed as Chinese with, uh, John Har with uh, uh, Harry Miller wearing a queue. And so they distributed literature, they taught classes, and they conducted their clinics. Unfortunately, Maud... Uh, became ill and died not uh, too long after they arrived in uh, the center of China. Harry moved to Shanghai, which of course was a very large uh, city, the largest city in China on the coast, and he rented a space in a building owned by a person named Charlie Sung, S-O-O-N-G. Now, Charlie Sung had been contacted by, ad, uh, not Adventists, but by other Christians and missionaries, and he had gone to the United States and been educated and was a Christian. He became acquainted with uh, uh, Miller uh, in this building, and Miller became acquainted with this family. Now, just a word about this family. One daughter uh, ended up being married to the finance minister of what became the China Chinese Republic, H. H. Kung. Another um, married the person who became the, the president of the New Republic when, uh, while Miller was there, they overthrew, uh, others overthrew um, uh, the emperor or the empress. 
And then another daughter married Chiang Kai-shek, and you've probably heard of him. He was the head of nationalist China. And so these daughters of this Christian Chinese person um, became, uh, you know, part of the ruling group of um, China, and Miller knew these. At one point, he also famously uh, helped to get um, uh, a young marshal who was a Christian convert uh, off of drugs. And so uh, Miller became a person who had contacts, and he started establishing uh, hospitals and clinics all over China. He also established the China Training Institute. He had a vision for uh, doing something very big in China at the time when Christians were being welcomed. At one point, he became president of the China Division. He also came back to the United States. And here he went to Johns Hopkins, uh, which at that time, as well as now, is one of the outstanding medical schools in the United States, and he trained himself to be a surgeon, particularly in operating on goiters. He also became the head of the Washington, what is now Washington uh, Sanitary, well, Ad Washington Adventist uh, Hospital, and uh, at that time it was called a sanitarium. And what did he do? He took the model of Battle Creek, and so out in Tacoma Park, in a little, slightly higher uh, part of Maryland, uh, just uh, north of, of Washington, D.C. He had people out on the lawns, and they stayed for considerable periods of time. Alexander Graham Bell was one of the people who was uh, a guest there, William Jennings Bryan. Miller, also with his experience at the highest levels in China, was called in by several presidents to consult with them about China. William Howard Taft, whom you know succeeded Teddy Roosevelt uh, as president, Woodrow Wilson, and Herbert Hoover. At the same time that he was fostering this uh, sanitarium and hospital in Tacoma Park, he also started a hospital down by the docks for the poor people the same approach that John Harvey Kellogg had had in Battle Creek and Chicago. He also then went back to China after um, the Second World War, and he did exactly the same thing. There is today, right now, an Adventist hospital in Hong Kong, Stubbs Road, which caters to, and has since its establishment, to the wealthy people of Hong Kong. In fact, they donated a lot to create this modern hospital. At the same time, Miller created a clinic and a hospital in Kowloon uh, on the mainland in the poor sections of Hong Kong. And the income from one helped to uh, support the uh, work in the poorer section. But Miller is a part of this story, not simply because of that. He is a part of this story because, as he said, I learned from Dr. Kellogg the importance of preventive medicine. And Miller, from the time that he'd landed in China, throughout his entire life, kept tinkering with soy products. These, this was inexpensive to grow. It was prevalent in Asia. And he felt that it had uh, great properties for helping people to avoid uh, illness. When he was in the United States uh, working uh, there at the Adventist Hospital in Tacoma Park, um, he had contacted the Department of Agriculture and worked with the chief chemist at the Department of Agriculture, Dr. Leclerc. 1937, uh, uh, Miller got a patent for Soilac. In Worthington, Ohio, where he worked for a while, he developed Vegilinx and soy cheese. And when he went back to Hong Kong to set up these two hospitals, he worked on a product called Vitasoy and brought it to production. And for a while, it was more popular 
than Coca-Cola or the other Coke drinks. Vitasoy, you may never have heard of it, but it was uh, a successful product, soy product there. In fact, <clears throat> he was cited for having, and given an honor, for having developed the first large-scale commercial enterprise in Asia. And UNICEF, which is a UN uh, organization, and the United Nations World Health Organization publicly lauded Miller's work with the soy products. Leclerc, after Miller died, said that Miller's work on soybeans was of far greater importance than the building up of sanitariums because it had to do with the preservation of thousands of lives. And if you think about it, soybeans and the soy products have become a staple. And a lot of that goes back to Miller. And so what he did in his conflict with John Harvey Kellogg and saying, no, I'm not going to stay in Chicago. I'm going to go overseas to China. What he did was to do exactly what John Harvey Kellogg and his brother had done in transforming the breakfasts of the United States and Americans to making it more healthful. But by focusing on soy products, he helped make the diet of the world better and affected even more people. And I think that this is an example of how the imagination of Adventists fired by uh, an apocalyptic worldview where one understands the conflict between good and evil as being cosmic and certainly worldwide uh, makes Adventists uh, think on a grand scale and attempt enormous things. You read uh, an article about the Stolls, Fernando and Anna Stoll. Here's another couple. Uh, Anna was graduated from the American Medical Missionary College uh, as a nurse. And uh, in 1903, uh, they worked in uh, Cleveland and then Akron, Ohio, after graduating, after she graduated from the American Medical Missionary College. And in 1909, they went to Lima, Peru. Now, what did they do when they landed in Lima, Peru? Well, Anna treated rich people uh, in the capital, in Lima, and they sold magazines. This combination of uh, publications and health uh, uh, continued in different parts of the world uh, from what uh, was going on in the United States. Then in 1911, they moved from this capital way up into the highlands, the Altiplano, and they uh, worked with the Amara and Chechua Indians, as you've read. And uh, you've also seen that they combined clinics with um, crop rotation. Uh, they got people off of cocaine and alcohol. And um, um, they also uh, developed markets. So what was happening, and there was tithing. So what was happening is that the stalls helped not just the physical health, but the health of the entire uh, uh, communities there around Lake Titicaca and even those who, some of them, lived uh, on the lake in straw um, huts. One of the people that you read, I think, is Jose Ancinas, and uh, he pointed out that it wasn't just that they uh, separated the people from the vices of coca and alcohol and curing illnesses, but the basic thing that they are transforming, I'm quoting now, uh, they are transforming the spirit of the Indian, bringing him into civic life, making him aware of his rights and obligations. And you recall, and this I wanted to underscore this, that they encouraged the Indians, along with Camacho, the stalls and Camacho, encouraged the Indians to take advantage of a practice of submitting memorials to the national government. And so they went over the heads of the rich landowners, relatively rich and landowners there in the Altiplano, to the central government. And um, there was a government investigation. You saw descriptions of scenes when these people arrived, and it made a difference. They were therefore uh, instructing the people in how 
to be a part of the civic life of Peru. And in the 1950s, there's a Quechua Indian raised as an Adventist, Ezekiel Gamanal, who ran for president of Peru, although he wasn't elected. However, younger people from the Altiplano trained in the Adventist schools and churches uh, have been elected and serve in the uh, parliaments, and they also serve these uh, launches and the successors, and they, they also ma had several uh, at one time uh, through the years. And they would sail from Belém to Manaus and back again a thousand miles. They would put typically 12,000 miles, um, uh, travel 12,000 miles a year, times 30 years, that's a long time. But then they received, and what did they do? Well, they ended up having doctors, 17 nurses in 79, 14 launches in 1979, and they treated people for malaria with uh, distributing quinine. Um, but they received the National Order of the Southern Cross from the Brazilian government. Why? Well, according to the citation, it wasn't only the fact that they distributed quinine and helped people physically. It's that they drew the attention of the government, and the government itself said this, it drew the attention of the government to the importance of these people as a natural resource because, of course, the Amazon basin became a great uh, resource for development for the increasing of the economy of all of Brazil. But what the Hallowells did was to heal the entire uh, communities of these people along the river because it brought the attention of, those, of the importance of those people to the entire uh, Brazilian government. Now, I have to tell you the downside of the story of this period. Again, we're talking about the first half of the 20th century, the period uh, after Ellen White died in 1915, and on into uh, the middle and just beyond the middle of the, of the 20th century. This is a period that um, has been described um, as quiet conservatism. Um, why? Well, in 1928, F.M. Wilcox, who was an editor of the uh, official Adventist publication, the Adventist Review, I'll call it the Adventist Review, it's had different names, but that's what it is now, the Adventist Review, and he took a nod, made a nod to uh, reform measures, but he urged the Adventists to cast their vote for prohibition quietly. Quietly. And um, that really described his attitude towards health reform and all kinds of reform. His associate editor who succeeded him to become the editor of the Adventist Review, the two of them uh, editing the, Re the Adventist Review for uh, well over 50 years, um, also said that when prohibition was repealed, he said, now the Adventist uh, movement can conform more closely to the distinctive pattern of the Adventist movement, which was to not emphasize appeal for legislation, but to focus on individual consciences. And it's been pointed out that this period, uh, from the 1920s on to the 60s, this period was a time when the beasts of Revelation 13, which had been interpreted by the founders of Adventism, as referring to, remember, both uh, Protestantism in America, but also the American government. It was focused more and more, the interpretation on Protestant America, so that it was a spiritual evil, not a governmental evil. And the emphasis was on what that apostate Protestantism would do in the future, right? at the end of time. And so the interpretation and relevance of the book of Revelation, particularly seen in the interpretation of Revelation 13, um, 
the interpretation was to put to be taken to the future not to the present it was to be applied to the spiritual institutions not to governmental institutions and just at a time when adventists were becoming uh, were becoming upwardly mobile and uh, and there was actually a son of an Adventist woman uh, who became president. Um, that all of those things meant that the Adventists were downplaying the apocalyptic critique of powers that were oppressing uh, uh, citizens and also emphasizing that we are interested in just individuals. Uh, a little symbol of that is that while we had been conscientious objectors and we had then been non combatants these are different ways of uh, standing over against uh, a war, we became, quote, conscientious cooperators. Uh, and our representatives in Congress became very friendly with the um, chairman of the armed services committees of the Senate and the House, some of whom were in office for a long period of time. Uh, in the 1930s, a general hospital uh, was created, Loma Linda, that graduated 59 medical cadets. And so that was the terminology, of course, from the military. In 1954, and for quite a while, there was something called Project White Coat, and uh, the Adventist Church encouraged Adventist, young Adventists to participate. They risked their lives, which is very admirable, participating in experiments. And these experiments tested how people could tolerate biological if the government prevented Adventists from exercising their faith. In the official Morning Watch publication, and you all probably know the Morning Watch where there's a verse every day of the week and then a meditation on that verse uh, for Adventists to use in their uh, devotionals for the day. On April 20, 1940, the Morning Watch extolled Adolf Hitler on his birthday. That was his birthday. And he became, in effect, the text for that Morning Watch entry. And... Um, they thanked uh, Adolf Hitler for his, quote, unshakable faith uh, that allowed him to do great deeds, quote, which decorate him today before the whole world. Um, I don't think that happened anywhere else in extolling other dictators. German Adventist publications supported the Nazi policies of Aryan, Aryan's racial purity and sterilization of and it's the whole panoply of people that it was okay to sterilize. And this is, the, uh, this is the ugly side of the idea of purity, uh, which John Harvey Kellogg became a leader of, particularly after he uh, was not a part of the Adventist Church. But it was uh, something that uh, progressives, quote, uh, who were interested in the importance of health and and felt that they were going to purify uh, societies. Unfortunately, they, um, they were accepted by Adventists in Germany. So it was okay, Adventists said, to sterilize the mentally weak, the schizophrenics, epileptics, the blind, the deaf, the crippled, the alcoholics, drug addicts, and even the chronically ill. There are even accounts that in some places Adventists turned over converts from Judaism to Adventism, turned them over to the authorities. Um, so Adventists have sometimes deviated and moved away from understanding their responsibilities to continue the struggle against evil and social forces that oppress fellow citizens, and that they will simply be involved with physical health of individuals. Uh, and not understand that healing, as far as our founders were concerned, healing had to do with things like slavery, things like um, temperance, and um, all of those forces that oppressed uh, the poor. Now, there were some Adventists in Germany, we must say, 
who didn't go along with this approach to Hitler. These were some Adventists who had, in the First World War, refused to bear arms. And there was that strain within Adventism that continued. And one of the products of that is Gerhard Hazel, who later became the dean of the Seventh-day Adventist Seminary in, uh, at Andrews. And from that group came Germans who went to Russia. Now, not all Russians, Adventists, agreed with these people, but some of them had an impact. And so I want to move to the Soviet Union and the true and free Adventists and uh, what they did in Russia. Uh, there was, of course, uh, a Russian Adventist community that uh, was also oppressed uh, by the Soviets, but gradually they became more and more recognized. But there was another group, an outgrowth of these uh, German Adventist reformers in, in, uh, in Germany that came to the German settlers who had been moved to Russia and one of them, uh, Vladimir Shelkov, became the leader of what became known as the True and Free Adventists. They focused on the importance of critiquing the government when they required uh, Adventists to bear arms. And so they became very committed to religious liberty. Shelkov spent 26 years in concentration camps and in internal exile. And in those concentration camps, he became acquainted with various dissidents, some of whom uh, were released. And um, Shelkov got word out to these true and free Adventists to help these people. And so they became people who not only were uh, printing Bibles in the Russian language, but they became people who in clandestine places risked their lives to uh, print the publications of uh, dissidents to the Soviet Union. Shelkov uh, managed to get a letter, a uh, public letter, out to President Carter, and uh, he said the convert becomes increasingly, uh, to Adventism, becomes increasingly aware of the needs of those about him and moves to meet the need. And here's the sentence, thus the spiritual approach inevitably affects social reform. Inevitably affects social reform. Well, it was in the middle of the 60s when I was in graduate school uh, at Harvard, and I had gotten to the point where I was working on my dissertation. I'd finished my classwork, basically. And... Um, there, was the, there were these civil rights demonstrations. Well, I participated in some of the nonviolent walks in the Boston area. Um, but then uh, Selma arrived. And you recall that uh, there, were, uh, there was this march in Selma, um, and uh, John Lewis, who's now in the U.S. Congress, was a young uh, leader, and he and others marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge on their way to Montgomery, the capital, and they were met uh, by white vigilantes that proceeded to beat them and injure them. Uh, and Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference decided that they would support. Now, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference was a middle-class group. They were people who led churches, big churches in the South, but they decided that they would support uh, this, this effort in Selma, in the heart of Dixie's, deep south. And uh, there may be some of your relatives who remember that uh, Martin Luther King went on television and asked people of conscience from across the United States to come and join him in a march from Selma all the way to Montgomery, which is a long way. Well, people around me in Boston and at the universities, they became very um, passionate about helping out there. There was a pastor, Reeb, a Unitarian pastor, who went down, and unfortunately, within days, he was killed in Selma. Well, that created an even greater passion. During this time, I had been reading 
uh, a little bit uh, in the history of Adventism, looking at Ellen White's testimonies and when they were written. And I knew about the ones that said um, in the later part of her life that we should be cautious. But at, in the early part of her life, she was saying things like we should disobey the fugitive slave law. So I knew that uh, for a nonviolent protest in the South, I, I didn't think that I was going against Ellen White's writings, although I was reading about it. I did know that the majority of Adventists at that time, during this time that I call the years of consolidation, um, this, this was a period when most Adventists would not approve. In fact, the editors of the review uh, the Adventist Review were not in favor of public protests. He risked his life, he'd risked his, um, his employment to help those around him that he thought were being oppressed. In my view, what he was doing is he was participating in the healing of the nations. Now, during this period, um, uh, of course, uh, not only were things happening in the United States, but by the 90s, late 80s and into the 90s, things were happening uh, in Europe. And you recall that this was a time when there was an iron curtain separating uh, the Soviet Union from uh, the rest of Europe. And then there were non-violent protests that were going on in Germany, and then in Czechoslovakia, and so on. Now, in Germany, uh, I discovered later when I went uh, into uh, Eastern Germany after the Iron Curtain had come down and talked to people uh, that um, there weren't very many Adventists participating in the protests. There was one Adventist, a young woman, the daughter of an Adventist employee in what was then called Karl Marx Stadt, it's Chemnitz now, um, who in 1989 started participating in prayer meetings that were being conducted by the Evangelische Church, Evangelische Kirche. These were Protestant churches, Lutheran churches, uh, and they were uh, quite powerful in East uh, Germany uh, because there were a lot of adherents. And they held these meetings uh, uh, to talk about what they might do. And um, this went on for quite a while. And one of the topics was, should they conduct nonviolent protests? Well, this young uh, woman, uh, 20 years old, went to this uh, uh, discussion on a Sabbath afternoon, and it went on and on. Should they, should they not? They'd all walked through uh, military to come to the church, and they knew that their pictures were being taken. Finally, she'd had enough. So she stood up in this church, uh, this Lutheran church, and she said, follow me. And the people did follow her, and that's uh, the beginning of those marches in uh, Karl Marxstadt, and they went on and on. They also <clears throat> started in Leipzig. I visited the church in Leipzig and found out that, as a matter of fact, uh, there were some elders of the main church, uh, Adventist church in Leipzig, who as individuals went out and joined. And those demonstrations got larger and larger and larger, and pretty soon more and more Adventists participated. Some came from other cities, and these elders would discover that some of the people that they were marching there were Adventists. But the, but the church itself did not want to have any meetings like the Evangelische Kirche did. They were very conservative. Now, in Czechoslovakia in 1989, you... Uh, re might remember that there was a Velvet Revolution. And um, there were not any official endorsements of the demonstrations. In fact, uh, when Václav Havel uh, had a petition that he distributed and asked people to sign their names asking for a change of government, peaceful change of government, 
there probably were very few Adventists that, that signed it. However, I met a Jan Pospisil who uh, was an, is an Adventist and was an Adventist student. And um, his story intertwines with the story of peaceful revolution in uh, the Czech Republic, the Velvet Revolution, called Velvet because it was peaceful. And uh, in uh, January 16, Václav Havel was arrested. Um, very few Adventists, if any, participated in the demonstrations that took place the next day. There were de nonviolent demonstrations uh, in August of that year, months later, October, November 1, November 15, and Possible became one of those people who participated. He would go to church in the morning and he would participate in the demonstrations in the afternoon if they happened to be on Sabbath and other days of the week as well. Well, on Friday evening, November 17, Friday evening, November 17, 1989, more and more people gathered in the university section of Prague, which is in the south section of Prague. Prague is not a huge city. And um, they decided when they got to be what people estimated to be 70,000 people, to march to Wenceslas Square, which is the main square uh, in Prague, and had been uh, the place where Václav Havel had demonstrated with just a few people, 70,000. They took a route that went along the Moldau River and uh, went past um, uh, Václav Havel's uh, apartment. They took a turn um, to past his house and past the theater where the theater uh, people dismissed what was happening and cheered the demonstrators on. But the police stopped them at the, at the end of that street so they couldn't get into Wenceslas Square and they stopped them at the other end. So they had them jammed in. Now, Jan tried to get around uh, these, this stopped uh, column of demonstrators and go along a road and then cross over. And he discovered he was behind uh, the police that were out in mass. And others uh, tried to do the same thing, and so there were a bunch of demonstrators behind the police. They got agitated, they turned around and rushed these demonstrators. And Possible was hit by something like, not a uh, baseball bat, but something like that, six or seven times. He was taken to the emergency room in the hospital, and uh, they found that they had to uh, stitch him up, six stitches. He had a broken finger, torn lip, injured mouth. His face was swollen. And then they let him go, and he went home. He didn't show up at church the next day. His girlfriend said, I know what's the problem, because she knew that he'd been participating, and the word had gotten out that there had been this big participation, and she found him. Also, a person who heard about it and went and took a picture of him was Otakar Yaranek. Otakar Yaranek was a convert to Adventism who was a photojournalist. He got a record from the hospital of all of his injuries and took a picture of this injured person and made a poster that went all over um, Prague so that this Adventist, with the help of this Adventist photographer, became... I'm going into other parts of the statement. Because we advocate the Christian and democratic traditions of the Hus and Comanius heritage, those were Protestant uh, reformers back in the 16th century uh, in uh, Bohemia, what was now Czechoslovakia, we wish further developments will lead to close reciprocal contact, greater conf confidence, and reconciliation. We understand that our mission that's the Adventist mission, consists of efforts to remedy corrupted human relationships among families and youth to improve ways of living and perform social activities. It goes on to say, This open letter, accepted by all delegates, we send as an expression of our sincere effort to help in the complicated situation in which our nations find themselves. 
Now this was a, a brave thing to do. You might say that this should have happened in Germany, in East Germany, uh, and maybe you, should, you would like to say this should have happened earlier. But it is, I think, an example of a certain time and a certain place where Adventist leaders came together because they had what I consider to be an apocalyptic worldview. That is to say, that if we're going to be concerned about health and healing, we're going to be concerned about the health and the healing of our entire community. And it's not going to be defined simply by physical health, though that's inter interconnected with all the other factors, but it's going, to be con it's going to be involved in a healthy society. That is part of our mission. This was also illustrated uh, later in the 1990s, 1993, in Sarajevo. I remember waking up one morning and seeing the Washington Post, and there was a headline, Neither shells nor gloom of war stays group from aiding Sarajevo. Now that's the takeoff on the, what the postman does, right? And so what the story says is that the Adventists of Sarajevo organized themselves they were, and got volunteers Serbs, Croats, Muslims, to carry letters and parcels from outside Sarajevo into a Sarajevo warehouse. And then they organized themselves to deliver parcels and letters all over a completely divided Sarajevo. And these people were able to get through all the myriad checkpoints of armed camps that had segregated and, and segmentized uh, Sarajevo. And the, uh, the uh, Washington Post reporter said, well, how are you able to do this? It would have been organized by Pastor Suslik, who was pastor of the main SDA church and who was also the ADRA direct director for Sarajevo. And he said, the volunteers belong to the region, but not to the conflict. You see, he said, we are nobodies and everybody's. And so, again, you have a group of Adventists who I think um, recreated the vision and embodied the vision of our earlier pioneers who were themselves embodying the apocalyptic vision of healing, meaning that you help the entire community. It was in this time, 1985-1990, at the highest level of the church, the General Conference President at General Conference sessions delivered statements about um, uh, our responsibility to take a stand as to what it meant to have a healthy society. Now, this is something that would not have happened in the years of consolidation going up to 1960. This took place in what I call the years of exploration. And it's very interesting. Um, and Neil Wilson, in 1985, at the General Conference of 1985, declared, among other things, that the arms race is a colossal waste of human funds and resources. And here's a very interesting statement and one of the most obvious obscenities of our day. Remember, however, that in the very earliest general conferences, we were taking stands uh, against um, what was going on in the Mexican-American War uh, and, uh, and the Spanish-American War. He said the Adventist uh, Church deplores all forms of racism, and he particularly condemned the po political policy of apartheid which was still uh, the law of the land in South Africa. Racism is, he said, a heresy and in essence a form of idolatry for it limits the fatherhood of God by denying the brotherhood of all mankind and exalting the superiority of one's own race. Now, for anybody that's interested in church uh, structure, these were not passed by committees. This was the General Conference President uh, articulating statements about what constituted a healthy society. And it didn't include um, um, arms race, and it didn't include uh, racism. 
1990, he continued to uh, make these statements. He said that there was an ecological responsibility, and he said belief in the imminent advent is not mutually exclusive with ecological concerns. Now, there had been an American Secretary of the Interior who was a very uh, prominent uh, and self-proclaimed evangelical Christian who said they didn't, he didn't need to spend money in the Interior Department on the environment because the Lord was going to come soon. This was a direct um, disagreement with that public official. He also talked for and on behalf of strict controls of automatic and semi-automatic weapons. He also scheduled, I can't resist saying I, I helped uh, pull this off, but he also scheduled uh, a session, a plenary session of the General Conference to hear about uh, tobacco and its uh, threat to the entire community. And uh, there was a representative of the World Health Organization there. There was the president of the American Cancer Society talking about this pandemic uh, from which tobacco companies were profiting worldwide and the role the churches could play in combating it. And uh, uh, it's during this time, 1995, that I helped to organize with the Methodists uh, the first interreligious coalition for smoking or health. And uh, there was, as a part of that coalition, a Muslim national organization, th the three Jewish uh, branches of Judaism in the United States, and both Catholic and Protestant organizations. The Protestants included Mainline uh, National Council of Churches and the Evangelical National Association of Evangelicals. And we produced statements along with uh, those health organizations combating tobacco to uh, advocate the raising of taxes on tobacco and also FDA regulation of tobacco. Um, we were just a part of this bigger coalition, but it was the first time that we were able to bring uh, religious organizations officially on board in attacking this social as well as health evil. Uh, we were greeted at different times by uh, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, by the Vice President, and by the President. Um, so, what I am suggesting here is that we need to have, in addition to uh, the metaphor, the biblical metaphor of the preservation of the body as a temple of God, that is purified in order for God to indwell within us, continue to dwell within us, we have to also, in addition to understanding uh, health as conformity to law and healing in getting people to obey the laws of our being, the natural laws, the laws of health, all of them God's laws. In addition to those two metaphors, we need to take seriously the apocalyptic metaphor of the healing of the entire cosmos. Um, and we have to take seriously Ellen White saying that the liquor trafficker is a part of the mystic Babylon of the apocalypse, dealing in slaves and souls of men. We have to agree with the perspective of Joseph Bates, James and Ellen White, Jan Andrews, Anna Knight, Anna and Fernando Stahl, that Adventists must work with God to peacefully but vigorously overthrow those who damage and harm and destroy the weak. The great controversy has that sort of combative element, but it also, uh, we know, in the book of Revelation, has the element uh, and the vision of the healing of nations. In Revelation 22, verses 1 to 4, we see in the biblical saga that the uh, story of the Garden of Eden is brought into the New Jerusalem. And we have at the end of the biblical account, creation restored. Let me read to you from Revelation 22. The river of the water of life, bright as crystal, 
flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, on either side of the river is the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. This is a positive picture within the apocalyptic understanding that there are struggles between good and evil on a cosmic scale and throughout our uh, existence here on earth. But not only are we to fight the powers of evil, we are to embody, according to this picture, we are to embody the ideal society. And that is a part of the healing of the nations. Ellen White said that the boughs of the tree of life, as depicted in this passage, the boughs of the tree of life, whose leaves are for the healing of all peoples, hang over the wall of this present world. That picture that is a part of the book of Revelation, she is saying, is a picture that should affect us today. From this perspective, Adventists have been truly Adventists when they have thrown themselves into challenging oppressive institutions, when they have thrown themselves into liberating people from disease and, and disability, but also concretely demonstrating now that future luminous society, that society where all tears will be wiped away, and eventually disease and death will be no more. That is what it means to be about our Father's business. Thank you, and we'll have a bit of a wrap-up the next time. Good luck with your essay, and I encourage more of you to get in touch with me as to what you're doing with the longer essay. God bless you. Bye.